Hey YouTube, welcome to another analysis of the Book of Five Rings. This is part four. Last time we finished the ground book together and we're going to start the water book. So, as far as the water book goes, it goes into details into the spirit of the school of thought that Musashi seeked to build. He says, language does not extend to explaining the way in detail, but it can be grasped in intuitively. Very important notion here. You can, uh, you cannot explain the way. What is the way? The way is how you live your life as a warrior. No matter what you want that meaning to be in terms of what a warrior should be doing with their life. Here, it shows that the way is in you. It's, it's what you're going to follow. The principles of the way cannot be explained because they're the principles of your life. And because in that sense, they cannot be put on paper per se, you could also argue that this entire book is worthless because he's writing a book about explaining the way. He says it can be grasped intuitively. There is a, a, a notion here that Musashi is not uh, writing on paper, but it's very important to understand. You can intuitively get knowledge from someone else's experience. Intuition doesn't come out of nowhere. Uh, it's a common misconception. It's even in animals, what we call instinct is not magic. It is something that is ingrained uh, biologically into the species that helps them survive. And it's the same for human. Your intuition is triggered by hints that you notice whether you are able to recognize them or not. This is the instinct of survival. This is the gift of fear, which is an amazing book that you should read. You are going to, whether you want it or not, have a very st uh, strong instinct for survival, which is going to create an instinct in you. So when he says that you can grasp things intuitively, it means that if you develop that instinct that some people lose completely as they age, but that almost every kid is born with, you are going to be able to extract knowledge from something that should not be explainable. This is the gift of, of this book. This is why if you read the book of five rings, the first few reads are going to be completely lost because there is no knowledge to be grasped unless you are able to do it intuitively, meaning that you are able to read through the lines of Musashi. And in a sense, you could also argue the fact that it also could mean that nothing in that book is of value because there is nothing written straight away that would give you information, but it's all of the beauty of it. You can find in it the wisdom that you want. He goes into saying that if you merely read this book, you will not reach the way. Absorb the things written in this book. Do not just read, memorize, or imitate, but so that you realize the principle from within your own heart. Study hard to absorb these things into your body. This is a key principle that you need to apply in your lifting journey as well. Do not be satisfied with just listening to information or reading information. You need to make it your own. Information you do not apply is worthless. If you read a two hours paper on how to get big biceps, but you never train your bicep, you just, you wasted your time. It's a waste of life. You need to apply everything because when you apply things, you make them your own and you are then able to potentially share the information and the new born material that was created through your experience with others. This is how we as a species evolve. We have an oral tradition. This is why we are the dominant species on the planet. If other species were able to pass on the knowledge more effectively, like we do by talking to each other, then they would evolve at a faster rate. A lot of scientists think that this is the reason why humans were able to be so performant is because we didn't just rely on instinct. We also relied on our ability to pass knowledge by speaking to each other and then later by putting it into books. So do not merely read things, absorb them. 
and never imitate things ever. Um, this is probably worse than just memorizing because when you imitate, you you color the action with with a nuance of idolatry, and you do not want to idolate anyone. Uh, you have to make your own way, so you have to make things your own. In strategy, your spiritual bearing must not be any different from normal. Both in fighting and in everyday life, you should be determined and calm. Meet the situation without tenseness, yet not recklessly. Your spirit settled, yet unbiased. For me, this applies to the demeanor and the energy you should be uh, exuding when you lift. A lot of people like to get very angry when they lift. A lot of people, like, like, they need to get into a trance. I don't think this is the right thing to do because it is not replicable. It is going to tire your, uh, your adrenal system. Your ability to, pr to produce adre adrenaline is going to get tired after a while. And you're going to become dependent to that state of, uh, of wrath and primal energy to be able to perform. If you manage to go into lifting with a neutral state of mind, then the PRs are going to be easy to replicate because the state of mind in which the PRs happen is going to be also very easy to abide by day by day. So you should be determined and calm without being tense, because if you're tense, the issue that's going to arise too is stress can be a good motivator, but it can also give you the yips and make you miss, and you don't want to miss, you don't want to fail. Even when your spirit is calm, do not let your body relax. And when your body is relaxed, do not let your spirit slacken. Do not let your spirit be influenced by your body, or your body be influenced by your spirit. Very important too. Uh, if you talk especially to powerlifters, they will tell you that you shouldn't let your state of mind determine the PR of the day. Just because you don't feel good, doesn't mean that your strength will not be there for the day. And the opposite is also, uh, is also correct. Just because your strength at the end of the workout is not where it should be, doesn't mean you're not going to be able to get the lifts you want. But that is going to be influenced by your spirit. <clears throat> uh, if your strength is not there and you're in high spirit, you should push through and let your spirit elevate your lifts. As far as not letting your, uh, your body relax when your spirit is calm and the opposite being do not let your body be relaxed, uh, let your body relax and then your spirit slacken, it basically means that you need to have the two in harmony at all times. Now, this could also be a very bad advice to give to people who are very anxious and who don't have the ability to relax. Uh, if someone is already hyperactive and always thinking about things and, and uh, worrying, then they should, add, they should learn the ability to relax your spirit. But most of the time, what I've noticed with these people is that it still, it still aligns with what Musaji says. It's either the body is agitated for a reason or the other, and therefore they let the, their spirit get agitated too, or it's the other way around, meaning that they are... Uh, letting their spirit be influenced by their body and their body be influenced by their spirit. But when we say that, it also means that in the, in the idea of what Musashi says, it means that ne neither the body or the spirit is superior to the other because n n they shouldn't dictate each other. But if they don't dictate each other and they should also always be one, then what is the truth? I think that what should be read behind that is you should strive to have a, a calm spirit and an always active body. Meaning that having a spirit that is calm does not mean that you're not thinking about anything. It means that you're focused and you're de determined. You're not letting spare thoughts invade your brain and you're not letting your body slacken. Be neither insufficiently spirited nor over spirited an elevated spirit is weak and a low spirit is weak as i said at the start of this paragraph 
going into the gym too hyped is not good because it's not something you can do every day. And going in the gym depressed and mortified and low energy is not good either because you're not going to get any gains from that. You need to find the middle ground. Most of life is finding the middle ground. Extremes are usually extremes for a reason because they're not beneficial in the long run. This one is interesting. Small people must be completely familiar with the spirit of large people. And large people must be familiar with the spirit of small people. Whatever your size is, do not be misled by the reactions of your own body. To start with the last sentence, you are going to find that your body does things sometimes that you do not understand and that we as humans try to rationalize all the time and we try to get meaning from them. Just because your muscle hurt on a, a warm-up set of squats does not mean you should stop running for the day. It doesn't mean you should ignore it, but don't make it a bigger deal than it is. Do not let a small ailment make you think that you have a, a debilitating disease. You are observing your body, in a sense, and you, you get to decide the way you want to interpret the things your body does. Remember, you're not your body. You are basically a spirit that is using that envelope to move around and do stuff. But the siege of your mind is here. You can cut an arm off and you're still going to be you. But if you lose your head and your brain seizes or loses the ability to function, then you're not you anymore. As far as small people and large people, it's tough to relate to bodybuilding because it is only something that is applicable to combat sports in a sense or things that you're going to use your body to oppose another opponent. There is a saying in sport that says a giant is no expert. What does that mean? It means that in most sports, being tall and big is going to be a very important advantage to have. But you're going to have, if you grew up in sports, you're going to find that people who are always, always advantaged by that, by their size and their strength, never had to learn technique. This is why someone like Shaq never had to learn three points. He had a bad uh, jump. Uh, uh, his jumper was bad because why would he need that? He could just drive into the paint and dunk on people or ask for the ball and back them up and dunk on them. So what's the point? Well, the point is that if he had those things in, in an hypothetic type of way, he would be better. So as far as people who are small, you need to understand what it means to have the advantage of having a large body. And if you're something who are large, you need to understand what it means for someone who's small to experience the sport because it gives you the advantage of insight. And this is also why something I've noticed with uh, combat sports and sports in general, people, and especially basketball, it's, uh, it's especially true in basketball and sumo, people who grew up small, meaning that until the age of 15 or 16, they were still small, and then had a growth spurt, tend to be better athletes. Uh, Michael Jordan, for example, was small for a long time before he had a massive growth spurt. And he was the best basketball player of all time. Why? Because he, dev he had to. When he was smaller, he had to develop the skills, the handling skills, the shooting skills, to be able to hang with the big guys. And then he became big. So he had the best of both worlds, basically. Musashi continues... And he gives advice, and this is to me uh, uh, a, show, a show of Musashi's understanding of the body, the human body. It shows to me that whether you want to believe that he existed or not, whoever wrote that book understood what posture should be like, which shows to me that they knew how to train. He tells you to lower both shoulders and without the buttocks jutting out, Put strength into your legs from the knees to the tip of your toes. Brace your abdomen so that you do not bend at the hips. So what is he basically telling you to do here? He's telling you to put your shoulders in a way where they're back and in their pockets, which is going to lead to a, a, a straight thoracic spine because shoulders that protrude immediately around the thoracic, the thoracic spine, so you're going to be straight by default, 
your further vision is going to be more open and your neck is going to be straight, so no problem with the neck. You're going to squeeze the glutes, which is very important for compound movements, but you're not going to let the glutes shoot back, which is, uh, uh, it has a name, I think it's lordosis, where you have your, your glutes that shoots back, which is a bad thing because it puts pressure on the lower back. You put strength in your legs, so you flex the leg, which is very important because it's the base on which you're lifting things with. You brace the abs so that the hips don't shoot back, which when your hips shoot back on the squat and deadlift, what happened? You're, you lose the ability to use your glutes and armstring and posterior chain, and you end up using too much lower back, which leads to injury. Musashi, who I think never did a deadlift in his life, understood intuitively that these things were to be applied to make a perfect warrior. Let's see, I think we're going to finish this page. He also says, in all forms of strategy, it is necessary to maintain the combat stance in everyday life and to make your everyday stance your combat stance. How is it applicable for people who lift? The posture you use when you lift, the, the, what people call universal cues, should be applied in real life. The reason why we do them when we lift heavy weight is because it is uh, an, uh, uh, an alignment of the joints that's going to prevent injury. So if it's going to prevent injury when you lift 200 pounds, it's also going to prevent overuse injuries in the long run when you stay in that position for long periods of time. So you should also have good posture in everyday life. And also, as he says here, and uh, it's a lot of uh, duality in what Musashi says, things feed into each other. The body feeds, feeds into the spirit, etc. If you make your combat stance, or your lifting stance, your everyday stance, it's also going to mean that you need to make your everyday stance your lifting stance, meaning what? If you're someone who's always like this, rounded like this, you're going to bench like this, you're going to squat like this, and you're going to deadlift like this. So the bad posture you have in everyday life is having an impact on your ability to lift and stay injury free. He also says the gaze should be large and broad. This is the twofold gaze. Perception and sight. Perception is strong and sight weak. And they wrote weak with two E's. Funny. Perception and sight would be the same difference, in my opinion, between listening and hearing. They mean the same thing, but not really. Because you can hear someone, but not listen to them. It, but it's tough to listen to someone if you're not hearing them. You can see something and not perceive it, but you can't really perceive something without seeing it as long as you're using your eyes. If you use another sense to perceive something, then yes. Perception, as he says, is strong, the listening is strong, and the sight is weak. It, we're going to stop here, but it's not a bad thing. Understand that saying that something is strong or, or weak is not a bad thing. Your, your deadlift is strong, but compared to your deadlift, your lateral raise is weak. Does it mean that the lateral raise is a bad lift? No. You have to apply things that are strong and things that are weak to benefit certain areas of your life. And this is what he is going to go on to develop, but that we're going to discuss in another installment of the analysis of the book of five rings. Thank you for listening. Have a good day.